Androgenetic alopecia, often simply regarded as genetic hair loss or male pattern baldness, casts the shadow over the lives of many, becoming a silent yet profound concern for those it affects. As delineated by Chin H. Ho et al. in the Stats Pearl online publication focusing on the prognosis of this condition, approximately 50% of both males and females experience this profound challenge. Characterized by the progressive loss of terminal hair on the scalp, its onset can manifest any time after the turbulence of puberty, weaving a tapestry of psychological, social, and physical implications. Androgenetic alopecia is understood primarily through its association with dihydrotestosterone, or as many of you know it as DHT, and an individual's genetic factors as well. The literature suggests that while DHT plays a crucial role in androgenetic alopecia, it's specifically the scalp DHT and not serum that contributes to hair loss. So all the talks about testosterone being the cause of male pattern baldness or contributing to it, not directly, perhaps indirectly because if you have testosterone and then this testosterone gets turned into DHT by conversion of 5-alpha reductase. So then in that particular way, yes, testosterone does contribute to you balding, but again, it's not directly. It's DHT and your genetic factors that makes your hair follicles sensitive to DHT. So let's delve in deeper, right? Because I like to do these overviews for the new people that come in contact with these videos. So the process of hair loss instigated by dihydrotestosterone, or DHT, is a complex interplay of biochemical events. It starts with the hormone testosterone present in both males and females. Then, the enzyme 5-alpha reductase converts testosterone to DHT in various locations, including, and we're mostly focusing on, hair follicles on the scalp. Once formed, DHT has a robust affinity for the androgen receptors in the hair follicles, leading to the creation of a DHT-AR complex. Now, this DHT-AR complex undergoes structural changes, allowing it to enter into the cell nucleus, where it binds to specific DNA sequences known as androgen-responsive elements, or AREs. This binding can influence the transcription of genes, leading to the changes in protein synthesis. A significant effect of this altered gene expression is the alteration in the hair growth cycle. Again, in individuals with the genetics for androgenetic alopecia, the antigen phase, or the phase in which the hair follicle is actively growing a hair, progressively shortens, whereas the telogen phase, or the resting phase, becomes elongated, causing the hair follicles to progressively miniaturize. As these follicles shrink over time, the hair they produce becomes finer and shorter. In some cases, the follicles become so minuscule that they no longer yield visible hairs. Furthermore, DHT has been linked to inflammation around the hair follicle, exasperating the hair thinning process. This sensitivity to DHT, however, varies among individuals, again, due to genetic predispositions, explaining why some people, despite having high DHT levels, may not experience hair loss at all, and why certain areas of the scalp remain unaffected, and that particular area is usually near the temporal and occipital regions of the skull. So those regions where you see like the Norwood seven dudes rocking out, you know, that, that hair in the back, those hairs typically are more DHT resistant. So we're going to touch on this later, but if you were to clone those hairs, wow, having an effective cloning process of DHT resistant hairs, would it even be required for us to take all this medication? Also, I want to mention this DHT likes to hyperactivate the sebaceous glands, and this contributes to more sebum production. So you can get issues like acne and seborrheic dermatitis. And in regards to seborrheic dermatitis, the link between that condition and DHT is probably why people like to express that they have a DHT itch, right? It's literally the manifestation of seborrheic dermatitis in some individuals. And that's why they're scratching their head. And from, from what I've read about descriptions of that feeling, it's kind of uncomfortable. And this this makes me think of androgenetic alopecia as a skin disease of sorts, as a definitely a skin disorder. Um there are people, particularly I saw this one video from Bald Cafe, and he was talking about how the stigma of researchers calling androgenetic alopecia patients 
sufferers or people having quote unquote disease is what contributes to the insecurity of balding. And I think of the condition. Okay, so the more it's portrayed as a disease, the more it's portrayed as this life threatening thing. We're talking about how male pattern baldness, this thing that affects all of us guys watching this video, has been made into this hideous, life-changing, uh, life-destroying disease that begs for treatment. And it's been made into that by the very people that are selling you these treatments. Fuck crux of the matter here, guys. It is a possible. That's a bit too far. If we look at the prognosis of male pattern baldness and what DHT is actually doing to the skin itself, it's creating inflammation and destroying hair follicles. I mean, I'm sorry, it's a skin disorder, it's a genetic disorder, and in many ways you can classify this sort of de destruction of skin structure and hair follicles as a disease. So yes, it is a disease. But yeah, now that's pretty much the crux of androgenetic alopecia. So if you're interested in learning more or reading about it, I'll leave some papers in the description to help individuals research. But definitely research beyond what I have put in the description because that'll only help you make more informed decisions. So when it comes to treatments, the current treatments we have access to, whether you're going to go through the FDA route and whether you're a medical researcher, right? You have to be a medical researcher here and you want to get your hands on experimental stuff so you can perform it on your research subject in a controlled, you know, clinical lab of sorts. Definitely not your room or your basement, right? So the treatments that we have. So we all know hair loss is a concern for many individuals and it's also, this particular field has had significant advances in treatment options over the years. The FDA has approved several treatments that have been proven effective in combating androgenetic alopecia. This is finasteride and minoxidil. But also in other countries, and even here in the United States, dutasteride is sometimes used as an off-label choice drug to combat androgenetic alopecia. Also, I think it's approved outright by the South Korean FDA, I'm talking about dutasteride for the treatment of androgenetic alopecia. And mind you, this is South Korea. They have very diligent research facilities and a very diligent food drug safety administration, probably more so than the United States in some cases. So again, in my understanding and how I think about it, if they approve dutasteride outright for use for androgenetic alopecia, and if, you know, here in the United States, we use dutasteride off-label, to combat androgenetic alopecia. It's safe. There's tons of clinical evidence that proves its safety. So people shouldn't be too concerned with either trying finasteride or if they just wanna start with dutasteride straight up and not even worry about hair loss, right? Just You can just do that. Of course, consult with the doctor, right? But yeah, in general, when it comes to treatments, what we have access to overall that's FDA approved, at least here in the United States, that would be finasteride, dutasteride, and minoxidil. Finasteride and dutasteride help lower 5-alpha reductase enzymes with finasteride specifically targeting the type 2 5-alpha reductase enzyme and dutasteride targeting all three isoforms, or I guess all three known isoforms of the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. That's type 1, type 2, and type 3. In contrast, minoxidil, originally developed for hypertension, was subsequently found to stimulate hair growth as a side effect so now we have topical minoxidil and even some people use oral minoxidil although i think it's a bit risky nevertheless people get results and you can get it off label here in the united states and many places in the world now in addition to these fda approved treatments there are several experimental therapies some under clinical trial and these clinical therapies show promise kinter pharmaceuticals is a huge player in this particular realm they're currently conducting clinical trials on KX826, or as many people know it as, pyrolytamide. Pyrolytamide is an androgen receptor agonist. So it goes into the hair follicle androgen receptor, it blocks it, and once that it's blocked, right, DHT can't bind to the hair follicle androgen receptor, and it can't induce certain messages to the cell to say, hey, cell, stop growing hair. 
So if DHT can't come in contact with that androgen receptor, then your hair, in theory, is saved. At least so long as you're using that sort of androgen receptor agonist or androgen receptor DHT blocker. And also, Kinter Pharmaceuticals is developing GT229, which functions by degrading and destroying the androgen receptor in the hair follicle cells. So potentially, this could be way more efficacious, right? I think we're going to see in the future if, you know, pyrolidamide gets approved and if GT229 gets approved, I think we're going to see some sort of combination of these two given to androgenetic alopecia patients. But yeah, only time will tell in this regard. We also have RU58841, also known as PSK3841, and this is an older treatment that never progressed past phase 2 human clinical trials. However, its mechanism of action is similar to that of KX826 or pyrolitamide, in it that RU58841 acts as an agonist to the androgen receptor, effectively blocking it from DHT binding. There are other notable experimental treatments. This includes topolutamide or fluoridil, another agonist of the androgen receptor, as well as clascoterone or CBO301. Now, clascoterone, as many of you know who actively watch this channel and other adjacent media, clascoterone has already been approved for the treatment of acne vulgaris and other acne-based skin conditions, and it's under the brand name Wenlivy. Cassiopeia Pharmaceuticals is currently trying to get Clascoterone to get past the phase 3 clinical trials for androgenetic alopecia, and it looks like there's a good chance that they might get that through phase 3 and then it will be gifted to the population, so to speak. But yeah, in terms of it being experimental, I call it experimental because it's not fully on the market. But in my opinion, and this is just my opinion by the way, because it's already FDA approved for acne, another sort of DHT-based skin condition, I don't see the issue in using it on your scalp, right? But yes, clascoterone is also an agonist of the androgen receptor. So it's blocking DHT from binding to it and doing all that nasty shit that it tends to do. With a combination of FDA-approved and experimental treatments at people's disposal, individuals experiencing hair loss have an array of options, offering hope for enhanced hair health and density. Now, here's where we get to stem cells, hair cloning, and all that fun stuff too. Now, I could make this video five hours long, going through every single bit of clinical research. I'm just making this to introduce people to the whole world of stem cells and hair cloning and, in general, regenerative medicine. Now, regenerative medicine, specifically here in this case of the video, stem cell hair cloning as well as general stem cell based regeneration treatments, represents a cutting edge frontier in the battle against hair loss and other many even more, you know, concerning conditions like organ failure, right? It would be crazy if one day and hopefully soon we can just 3D print livers, kidneys, hearts eyes for that matter just new limbs for people who have gone through accidents or maybe were born without specific limbs now bringing it back to a focus on hair right unlike traditional treatments that often focus on halting hair loss or promoting existing hair growth stem cell hair cloning delves into the realm of creating new hair follicles altogether at its core the technique involves extracting healthy hair follicles from the patient so that classic donor zone that I mentioned before, you know, the occipital lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe area, also called the Hippocratic reef. And once these hair follicles are extracted, they are then cloned, multiplied in mass in a laboratory, and then implanted back into the scalp to stimulate new hair growth in regions that were formerly bald. So we're cloning these hairs, we're, you know, multiplying them. Let's say we have a Norwood 7 patient, right? We want to get him back to Norwood 1. We're multiplying hundreds of thousands of hair follicles. And then we're going to be like, yep, hey, we're going to do sessions. We're going to put these hair follicles back in your head. And because they're of your body, they're just cloned hairs that we got from a healthy region, you know, the, the donor area, right? We're now going to give you your hair. We're going to repopulate your scalp with cloned hair follicles of ideally what was a DHT resistant strong hair follicle. Now, this is the particular method, and this method holds promise of not just restoring lost hair, but potentially offering an unlimited supply 
of new hair follicles for transplantation. While it is still in development stages, with many technical challenges to overcome, the potential of stem cell hair cloning, as well as stem cell activation, right? Now, this is exciting these stem cells inside of the bald regions of the scalp to actually turn on the hair follicles and grow new hair. That's also a path that many scientists are looking at. And with excess research, regenerative medicine has ignited considerable excitement and hope in scientific communities, as well as people who are just affected by conditions where stem cells could definitely help. Now, there's this particular academic article titled, quote, Therapeutic Strategy for Hair Regeneration, Hair Cycle Activation, Niche Environment Modulation, Wound-Induced Follicle Neogenesis, and Stem Cell Engineering, unquote, by Shan Chang Chu et al. And the researchers delve deep into the contemporary development in the realm of hair regeneration, with a concentrated emphasis on stem cell biology, hair cycling, and tissue engineering. The authors categorize the hair follicle regeneration process into four principal segments, the regeneration of hair from existing follicles, the generation of chimeric follicles by combining different tissues, understanding the influence of both local and systemic factors on hair growth, and also finally, the creation of entirely new hair follicles. During their comprehensive study, a significant finding emerged that non-bald and bald scalps possess an equal number of stem cells. However, there was a marked depletion in the number of progenitor cells in bald scalps. Now, progenitor cells are the descendants of stem cells, and then they go on to further specialize and differentiate into different types of cells. So these stem cells are just not turning into hair follicle cells. Drawing from this particular observation, Shang Cheng et al. concluded that hair loss isn't precipitated by a lack of stem cells, but rather the unsuccessful activation of these stem cells. To address this, researchers are currently exploring methods to transform regular stem cells into these progenitor cells. And this also links neatly back to SCOOB3. SCOOB3 being that molecule that was discovered by UC Davis researchers who were trying to observe how hair grows. Anyway, Shen Chang and colleagues elucidate multiple causes of alopecia, including scenarios such as the inability of the hair follicles to regrow hair, external disruptions to follicular stem cells, and complete loss of hair follicles. The intricate biology behind hair growth is presented, focusing on the recurring growth cycle stages of hair follicles, and also the pivotal role of various molecules in these processes. Central to hair formation is the interaction between the skin's epithelial cells and the mesenchymal dermapapilla. Now, there's another company as of late that has been catching some attention, and this is Organ Tech Co. LTD, or We'll just call them organ tech and and this is a particularly active japanese business that exists in the realm of organ regeneration it's spearheading innovations that could reshape the future of not only japan's regenerative medicine industry but also the world right now organ tech is focusing on regenerating hair follicles teeth and other organs they also turn their attention to next generation tooth implants that they've had success with recently by 2024, clinical studies for hair regeneration are expected to commence by this particular company. So everyone is paying attention to organ tech right now. While they've made some breakthroughs with their next generation hybrid implants that can mimic the whole natural tooth physiology, there are noteworthy challenges that they are going to face when it comes with, again, cloning hair follicles. Specifically, when it comes to implementing hair follicle regeneration, the process stands to be intricate and currently an expensive one. And with this whole expense issue, this will necessitate innovations for more cost-effective means of multiplying, duplicating, cloning, right? Cloning hair follicles. So currently, Organ Tech's publicly stated approach for addressing androgenetic alopecia is nothing special. It's similar to the process that I mentioned before. In order to clone healthy hair, the company Organ Tech will be looking to the donor area hair as a resource in which they can find DHT resistant healthy hairs and then go on to duplicate them, multiply them by whatever amount and essentially implant them back into a scalp and ta-da, now you have a what should be healthy hair follicle. 
Also, I should say that they're not just simply taking out the hair follicle, right? They're amplifying the epithelial cells and dermal papilla cells. And subsequently, by this process, they're going to produce a regenerated hair follicle. So it's literally the tissue itself that they're trying to clone. The tissue that contains the healthy properties of a hair follicle. So currently, Organ Tech can magnify a single hair follicle by a factor of 50 to 100 times. So realistically, they're probably going to have to gather a variety of DHT-resistant hair from the Hippocratic Reef or, you know, that classic area, the parietal and occipital lobe region, right? They're probably going to have to get a ton of those hairs because they all have genetic variation of some sort and they're going to clone them, right? But there are several challenges that hinder the consistent success of this particular process. Firstly, the researchers have to ensure the accurate replication of the hair follicle's microenvironment. And this is, you know, very crucial. The hair follicle is a complex mini organ with specific interactions between the dermal papilla cells and epithelial cells. So they might have to do a bit of research to try to get this particular microenvironment going on. Any disruption or inaccuracy in the interaction can hinder hair growth. Secondly, the bioengineering process must maintain the cell's inductive growth properties, ensuring they can signal hair growth when transplanted. Now, over time, with multiple cell divisions in a lab, cells can lose this particular capacity. So here, we're going to have a scalability issue. So again, going back to what I said before, this is probably where they're going to have to get a variety of DHT-resistant hair follicles, and then they can only multiply them a set number of times before that multiplied you know let's say it's that set number of times is like a thousand times right let's say after 1001 that's when you start getting shitty hair follicles they're going to have to find a variety again a variety of dht resistant hair follicles from the donor area and this particular part is easier said than done they can also go about just trying to fine-tune that replication process to the point where you can duplicate multiply do whatever X amount of times and it wouldn't harm the cloned hair follicles, right? Even if it's a clone of a clone of a clone of a clone, it'll still be healthy. So they have to do some research to figure all that out. And finally, they have to make sure that the hair follicle itself, the cloned ones, can successfully reintegrate back into the scalp of the balding patient. And we have a ton of information already when it comes to hair transplants, so I don't think this is going to be the most difficult part in the process, but rather the whole multiplying a single strand of hair or a collect single strand of hair thousands upon thousands of times and trying to get the exact microenvironments for each hair follicle, that is definitely going to be the issue. But surely enough, I think with continued research and also just looking at how this particular field of regenerative medicine has exploded in the past 10 years it's very conceivable that we will have this technology within the next eight years i know it's a meme it's like oh hair loss cure is five years away but we've been making some as you know as human species has been making some incredible advancements when it comes to stem cell research and also hair cloning and just organ cloning in general so if we can get the replication process down ensuring the micro environments are maintained and healthy hair follicles duplicated thousands of times would be our particular solution to covering those bald scalps well that's pretty much it for this video there's a lot of research going on when it comes to stem cell technology and regenerative medicine so i just wanted to bring some sort of scientific basis to the layman on this particular channel and i just wanted this to be explained right interesting topic so i wanted to house it on my channel for people who are currently in the process of binging my content so in the meantime keep taking your 5 ars finasteride dutasteride keep using minoxidil whatever you have to do and are willing to do right right to keep those hair follicles active and actively growing hair so if you got this far into this video comment sheep yep sheep s-h-e-e-p and as many of you know dolly the sheep serves as one of the world's most famous successful cloning experiments i actually read this somewhere maybe i'll put a screenshot on the screen but i read that dolly the sheep died not because it was some sort of unsuccessful clone but rather it came in contact with some sort of i think respiratory illness or just some sort of illness in general from the environment so there's that but yeah again interesting topic definitely you guys should go do some research on it and yeah, comment sheep. 
or you can comment Dolly, right? Dolly the sheep. Anyway, <laughs> I just thought I'd, it would be nice to add this in, but I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace out.